Shalom. So, do you know about the James Webb Space Telescope, JWST, previously known as Next Generation Space Telescope, NGST? It's a planned space observatory scheduled to launch in October 2018. The James Webb Space Telescope will offer unprecedented resolution and sensitivity from long wavelength visible to the mid-infrared and is a successor instrument to the Hubble Space Telescope and the Spitzer Space Telescope. This telescope features a segmented 6.5 meter, that's 21 feet, diameter primary mirror and will be located near the Earth's Sun L2 point. A large sun shield will keep its mirror and four science instruments below 50K, which is minus 220 degrees Celsius, minus 370 Fahrenheit. James Webb Space Telescope's cap capabilities will enable a broad range of investigations across the fields of astronomy and cosmology. A particular goal involves observing some of the most distant objects in the universe beyond the reach of current ground and space-based instruments. This includes the very first stars, the epoch of reionization, and the formation of the first galaxies. Another goal is understanding the formation of stars and planets. This will include imaging molecular clouds and star-forming clusters, studying the debris di of disks around stars, direct imaging of planets, and spectroscopic examination of planetary transits. If I understand correctly, the expectation is that the James Webb Space Telescope, successor to the Hubble, will be able to peer back into the beginning of the universe. Scientists are actually saying that it can almost see the beginning of time. They say that it can look further back in time than the Hubble telescope, almost to the dawn of creation. And if I understand correctly, as a layman, I could be wrong, but I think that what is going on here is this has to do with the idea that since it can see so far, and it will orbit, by the way, about one million miles from the Earth, it sees so far, it has to do with the speed of light and how long it takes light to reach the Earth. I guess it sees, it sees these images before they get here. The further back it sees, the longer ago it is seeing. Huh? Anyway, it's to be launched in 2018, it'll be years behind schedule, and it will cost about $8.8 .8 billion. You have to admit, seeing the beginning of time sounds really interesting. So, about Parshat Bo, this week's Torah portion, in a word, this week's Torah portion is about the transition from being slaves in Egypt to a state of being called Cherut, which will translate as freedom. This parsha really only deals with two themes, the final three of the ten plagues and the commandments that begin in chapter 12, namely the sanctification of the new moon, the concept of the new moon, Rosh Chodesh, beginning with the month of Nisan, and the Passover offering. Both of these ideas really represent the, <coughs> the very essence of time. So what's going on here in Parshat Bo? God, as he puts it here in chapter 10 and verse 2, is making a mockery of Egypt. He's toying not only with the Egyptians' conception of reality, but with the fabric of reality itself. By the time it's time for the locusts, Pharaoh's servants were getting really antsy. Send out the men that they may serve Hashem their God. Do you not yet know that Egypt is lost, they said to Pharaoh? When our sages describe the horrors of ancient Egypt, try to get us to understand what it was like. They explain what our forebears went through there and experienced there in their servitude. They emphasize, our sages emphasize, the totalitarian aspect of the regime, its evil, its manipulative and abusive mind control, its structure and nature, and the absolute control which was exercised over the slaves. In a word, our sages put it very succinctly when they said, they described this living hell of Egypt, that they said, it's a place from which no slave ever escaped. Suddenly in the midst of all of this, after the final warning, 
After the warning of the slaying of the firstborn, the warning of the great and unparalleled outcry that shall be heard in Egypt, in all of Egypt, appearing suddenly, after Hashem said to Moshe, Pharaoh will not heed you so that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt, suddenly, chapter 12 begins with the words, Hashem said to Moshe and Aaron, in the land of Egypt, all right, well, yet in the land of Egypt, saying, this month shall be for you the beginning of the months. It shall be for you the first month of the year and the mitzvah of the Passover lamb, which is an eternal covenant binding upon all of Israel forever. But this idea, the interjection here of Rosh Chodesh, the new moon, it's not just about the month of Nisan being the first month of the year. It's not just about measuring time from Passover, making sure that Passover always falls out in the spring. The Jews went from being slaves in Egypt to this state of being called chirut, which means freedom, to being b'nei chorin, which literally means children of freedom, tr people to whom freedom is now their, their uh, designation. But in English, there are two words. There's liberty and there's freedom. Give me liberty or give me death. And people interchange them. But are they the same thing? liberty and freedom? Actually, no. Apparently, freedom is not liberty. Liberty generally refers to one's relationship with the state, to a citizen that's not being controlled, but freedom is understood to mean to be free to be able to make choices. Liberty is defined as the right and the power to believe, act, express oneself as one chooses, of being free from restriction, having the freedom of choice, it's a condition of having the power to act and speak without restraints. But freedom, on the other hand, I find, is defined as the power to decide one, one's actions, and it's also referred to as free will. The ability of each individual to make choices that are free. So liberty is the power to act and express oneself according to one's will, while freedom is the power to decide one's actions based on free choice, which of course is the underlying principle of the existence of a human being. God gives us the ability to choose. You can't choose if you're a slave. You can't choose between right and wrong. You can't choose to act correctly. You can't choose to be conscious even. So why all of a sudden now in the timeline of our Parsha is Pesach introduced? because it's the time that we went out from Egypt? Why Rosh Chodesh right now, the, the mitzvah of sanctifying the new moon, of measuring time? Why is this element of time interjected at this particular point? The symbology, the understanding of Egyptian enslavement is not only about being enslaved to <clears throat> taskmasters or wicked regimes or even false gods but to be enslaved to time itself. Time is the greatest and most powerful master of all. Everything is expected, everything is ordered. We are forced to worship and ultimately to fear and cringe from our own chronology. Thus, while yet in Egypt, Israel was commanded with Rosh Chodesh, the concept of the new moon, the concept of measuring time, because before they can leave Egypt, they actually were freed by God through the mitzvah of Rosh Chodesh, through the commandment of measuring time. They were freed from the enslavement to the false chronology of time. Kiddush HaChodesh, the concept of sanctifying the new moon, actually represents Israel's mastery over time. Because following in the footsteps of Moshe and Aaron, the Sanhedrin, which is the body of wisdom for the Jewish people, is given the authority to determine the dates, the arrival of the festivals. Talmud teaches that even if the Beit Din, the rabbinical court, would make a mistake in time, the heavenly court will uphold their ruling and the, and the timing will be set according to the findings of the sages. The Beit Din, the rabbinical court is given the authority to establish the months 
which is the very fabric and pattern of time, based on eyewitness testimony or witnesses who come and see the new moon. Do you ever have a pet hamster? Maybe you have one now. We should let it go, really. But if you ever see a hamster on a wheel, just a word about hamster wheels, according to Wikipedia. Hamster wheels, or running wheels, are exercise devices used primarily by hamsters and other rodents, but also by other cursorial animals when given the opportunity. Most of these devices consist of a runged or ridged wheel held on a stand by a single or pair of stub axles. Hamster wheels allow rodents to run even when their space is confined. By the way, the earliest dated use of the term hamster wheel located by the Oxford English Dictionary is in a 1949 newspaper advertisement. Then on Wikipedia, there's a picture of a hamster on a wheel. And the caption reads, like other rodents, hamsters are highly motivated to run in wheels. You know, I feel sometimes very overwhelmed by endless amounts of work. I feel like I'm not getting anywhere. I had this thought this week that I feel like a hamster in a wheel, just moving in one place all the time. And you know, hamsters, they get this look of stricken anxiety. I guess they realize that they're not really going anywhere, but they just keep on doing it anyway, faster and faster and faster, moving in one place. And then at the end of the day, instead of getting off the wheel, you kind of just collapse like this on, the, on your side and then get back onto the wheel, not really going anywhere. Slaves to time. And then Hashem says, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. And what that's really all about, the mitzvah of Rosh Chodesh, the message here, is about breaking out of that wheel, <clears throat> leaving behind the constraints of slavery, of time, of chronology. Now back to the telescope. You want to see the beginning of time, you want to know the secret, it's right here in Exodus chapter 12. This month shall be for you the beginning of the months. This is the beginning of time. Because a slave cannot mark time, cannot serve and be connected to reality, to the one living God, if he is enslaved to time. And the biggest entrapment and the biggest, in Egypt and the biggest tool of manipulation that Pharaoh used was this feeling of being on that wheel. But to see the beginning of time and to master time, that's actually our goal in leaving Egypt behind. We could save $8.8 .8 billion just by understanding what the Torah is telling us. We want to leave Egypt behind. We want to leave behind its enslavement, its idolatry, its worship of, of the self and self-aggrandizement, but also of our feeling of futility, the fear and the vulnerability that the mental games and the manipulation of Egypt make us feel. This is the call of the timeless Torah in reminding us constantly throughout the Torah that we were slaves in Egypt and that God took us out from there with an outstretched hand. The Torah is challenging us in every generation to leave Egypt, to get off the wheel and to get a life, a real life, not a life constrained by the illusions of time, but eternal life, to be truly free to choose life.